Hello, everyone, and welcome to Score Fairfield County's live webinar on Instagram for Business. I'm Bob Hogan, the webinar coordinator today and a business mentor here at Score Fairfield County. I'm going to be your host today, and our presenter is Nalini Gulzaran. More on Nalini in just a minute, but first, some brief information on Score. Nalini, if I could ask you to advance the slide, please. Um, SCORE is a nonprofit national partner of the SBA and locally here at SCORE Fairfield County, we have about 130 volunteers with a wide range of industry process and subject matter expertise. And we offer three primary value added services to small business owners. First of all, we offer free one-on-one -on -one counseling and you can do that by video, telephone or email. And you can access that by either using the yellow bit.ly link that you see on the screen or you can go to our website, fairfieldcounty.score.org and click on the request a mentor link. Secondly, we offer a wide range of educational workshops and webinars like this one, uh, roughly 150 throughout the year. And lastly, we offer extensive resources on our website, including access to subject matter experts. Our next live webinar will be uh, next Tuesday, March 23rd at noon. And the topic is the top 25 ways to get your prospects to believe you and close more sales with Ed Winslow presenting. You can find more specifics on our website, fairfieldcounty.score.org. And we also have a large number of archived webinars on our website that uh, cover a wide range of business topics. And you can view those on demand at any time. Uh, just some logistics for today. Uh, we've set aside time for uh, Q&A at the end. If you have a question, please use the chat feature and you can access that by hovering on the bottom of your screen and clicking on the chat box and you can submit your question at any time and we'll uh, take as many as we can at the end of the webinar. Uh, we will end our webinar sharply at one o'clock and the session is being recorded and the link to the recording will be available on our website within the next couple of days. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Nalini Gulzaran. Nalini is the founder of Edge Space Marketing and is passionate about transforming business practices and streamlining communications. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Information Systems and experience in IT project management and communications. Before becoming an entrepreneur, she was an associate COO for a division of a global financial institution. Nalini believes in the strength of her community and regularly volunteers for organizations and causes that empower the next generation. Nalini, it's all yours. Thanks, Bob. And for those of you who can see me, I've just turned on my video. Um, I do want to start by letting you guys know I've lost my voice, so I'm going to do my best to uh, not cough or uh, hold on to it for the remainder of the session. Um, for those of you who've been to my classes before, as Bob said, my name is Nalini Gulstrand, and in my previous classes, I tend to do demos for Instagram in particular. Today, we're going to be talking quite a bit about strategy and how you use your Instagram, so we won't be doing any demos today, but keep in mind that as you use your Instagram, we're really going to be talking about how to connect with your audience and engage with them. So on our agenda today, we have um, some idea of how to use Instagram to grow your business as a general understanding. How do we know who your audience is? The 80-20 rule, some best practices, some content planning, and then the steps to stay engaged. This is actually a very important part of how you manage your social media strategy. So let's first start by figuring out how do we create quality Instagram content and engage your followers? The most important thing here is to figure out what is it that your audience wants and how do we give it to them? As business owners, we always want to give them what we have, right? I have a service, you need it. But the way Instagram marketing works and digital marketing in general, it kind of takes the traditional marketing model and turns it on its head. When you think about the way marketing used to be, whether it's Louis Vuitton or perfume, clothing brands, they create something that's called exclusive marketing, right? Where it's an exclusive club and you want to be in it. Today's marketing is about what's called inclusive marketing, where we want the validity of the community. Think about yourself when you're about to go on a trip post-pandemic, right? None of us are going anywhere at the moment, but post-pandemic, when you're getting ready to go somewhere, you're going to go to TripAdvisor. Some people go to Facebook and they look for recommendations. And part of what you want to do is be part of that conversation so that you become the brand or business of choice. So let's talk about what that means. And the biggest part of what that means is being social and social media. We're gonna talk about strategy, content and engagement. 
let's start with your strategy. Let's figure out who your target audience is. So your target audience, it's about building an audience profile. There's a lot of factors that go into who these people are and what they want. Now, when you think of social media, anyone and everyone's on there from different ages to different demographics to different regions. It's almost this big equalizer where you can meet people around the world and connect with folks around the world. And if you have a brand that's global, that's great. If you have a small business that's very hyper local, that's also great because you can figure out how to engage with them and what those values are. So you want to talk about their demographics, what's behavioral about them, their physiographic, and their geographic traits. These are all the parts that go into it. Now let's break that down a little bit more. When you think of the demographic of your audience, you're looking at an age range, a gender, a nationality, maybe their ethnicity is important, occupation, income, and family size. Now you may ask yourself, why do I care? The reason you care is because you're trying to connect with your audience's values. And how do you know what their values are if you don't know these details? For example, we have generational values. So that's why it's important to know what your age ranges are. If you have a product, let's say you're a food blogger or you're providing a food that's very specific to a cuisine from a specific region of the world, you want to know what ethnicity and nationalities are interested in that. Not to say that everyone isn't, but there are people that are going to lean more into your type of cuisine. When you want to think about income and family size, Income is important because if you have a brand that's a luxury brand, then folks who are not quite in an income bracket that it can afford your brand may not be your target audience, unless of course you're creating a dream for them so that when they are able to afford you, then you can um, engage them. So some things to think about. That's a little tricky, but it's why income is important. And then also family size. When you talk about family size, um, the current generation, my generation, we are starting families later in life. So whether you have a product that's geared towards children and you're trying to engage with an audience that doesn't yet have children, but they might be aunts and uncles, right? So that's why you want to know some of these things. So as you craft your messaging, you're speaking to them and to their values. When you talk about behavioral, you've got brand loyalty, you've got you're the benefits they're looking for, you've got their user status, usage rates, occasion, like a special occasion, and the readiness to buy. So let's start at the bottom of the list with readiness to buy. This is very important, especially as we were talking about that luxury brand, right? Most of us are small businesses. We don't have a luxury brand. However, we do have a price model and not everyone is going to be able to afford this, whether or not we're luxury or not. So that's what readiness to buy means and why that's important because your call to actions may not be buy now, it might be learn more. And that's why it's important to know that and realize who you're reaching out to and how you engage with them. Going through that list as you think about it, not all of this is important to every business, user status, usage rates, um, but others are. So for example, I'm in digital marketing and I have lots of friends and family that do not own small businesses. So digital marketing is meaningless to them. They know that when they have a business they wanna engage with, they go look for that business's website, but they may not engage directly with my business or brand because they don't have a business. So that's why it's important for me to know what those behavioral traits are. When we talk about geographic, um, and this actually goes to the question that I see in the chat about hyperlocal. So we're going to talk about region, country, population, and climate, right? We live in the Northeast, those of us who are in Stanford, it is very cold today. So if we're creating a post about winter gear, we want to make sure that we're targeting the regions or talking to people in regions where it's cold. We don't really want to be talking to folks in Miami or tagging Miami as a location or using um, hashtags specific to Miami. I'm going to get into hashtags in a little bit, but that's kind of the idea of knowing what the geographic footprint is that you want to reach. The question in the chat for those of you who may not have seen it is if your business is hyper local, how does that bigger picture or global reach help my marketing? That's a very important question. The global reach is important because of brand awareness. Everyone has someone that is not necessarily right next to them, whether it's a friend or family, a college friend, a college roommate, we all have people spread out around the world. And what's really interesting is that as you have conversations with people, you'd be surprised how often it comes up like, oh, I remember seeing something about what you're talking about on social media. So while your audience, because you have a very hyper local brand, 
you could also be reaching folks around the world who could be telling people to look for you because you're hyper local, or maybe they will be traveling here at some point and they want to, they're making a list of the things as we think about researching for trips. And there's a lot of people planning ahead for whenever they can start coming out of pandemic mode and getting into vacation mode again. When you look at psych, um, psychographic, oops, let's go back one. As we look at psychographic traits, lifestyle, personality, values, and interests, this is probably one of the most important things you want to consider when someone's lifestyle, whether it's home buying or traveling, right? What are those values and what are they interested in? When you think of personality, it's also kind of, kind of falling into the same thing. We all have different interests, right? We have our business type um, information we look for, but we also have the personal things, whether you're interested in um, things like shoes and hair or interested in arts and um, motivation, right? So if you know all of these things about your audience, you can start to build a, a content strategy that'll really help you engage and reach them. So I just threw a bunch of stuff at you. So how do you actually apply that? So here are some questions you can ask yourself. Who is your audience? How do they feel about not just you, but your organization? Which topic and trends are they passionate enough about to discuss online? And what do they truly want and how can you connect with them effectively? Now let's break all of that down a little bit more. There are things that we are all passionate about and social media creates an opportunity and an avenue for people to share their opinion. Now, rightfully or wrongfully so, there's lots of people that get into arguments on social media. And as a business, we kind of have to manage that line, right? So for example, if trending topics are about politics or about social justice, you wanna be very careful with the tone of your messaging so that you neither, if you wanna stay neutral, you stay neutral, or if you want to speak on a topic, you're gonna have to pick the side that you wanna be on and speak on that topic and know that your audience is going to split. And, and being okay with that because people will share their opinions on social media. Now, again, it's about values, right? The younger generation, when you start looking from 20 something to almost 40 year old, those folks are very much interested in not just what you do, but how you give back to the community, right? How do you engage with your community and what you're really about? We know we're all in business to make money, right? We all have to pay bills and that's what businesses are for, but people are taking it a step further and really holding businesses accountable for that. So if you're a small business and you do volunteer work, you might want to share that. Excuse me, if you're doing fundraising for certain things, you want to share that. So those are some of the things that you want to keep in mind. But again, when we talk about the next question, which is things that they're passionate about, your volunteer work and where you're donating your funds are what's going to get scrutinized. So just again, you want to share, but you want to keep in mind that people will always have an opinion. You have to manage that kind of carefully. So now we want to talk about content layers, right? We know now who we're talking to, right? Hopefully we've kind of figured that out generally and we're working on that. Now we've got to figure out what is it that we want to talk about? So I can go on social media and I can talk about marketing, sort of, right? I could talk it in very broad topics. I can say things like, you need a marketing strategy, but that's not actually telling you anything. So let's break down what those content layers look like. You've got your general topic, your business or brand, and then your specific brand offering. So if we were to use myself as an example, we've got the general topic is digital marketing. We've got your brand or business, which is edge space marketing. And then we've got the specific brand offering, which is search engine optimization, Instagram tips, web design best practices, and marketing tips. Now I've kind of done this in a way where I've used the hashtag to kind of give the example. When you're doing this exercise, you don't need to figure out hashtags. This is just to show you that these are four topics of content that I would build around. And we're gonna get into some of that specifics around what that could look like shortly. So here's something that I always encourage folks, um, if we were teaching this class in person, we would be breaking out into individual groups, partner up and start to do this with someone. This is something very important to do with a partner. You can do it by yourself, but sometimes you need a sounding board for people to help you figure out if this makes sense. So your first thing you wanna figure out is how would you describe your target audience? Write it as a sentence, right? So an example is a 20 year old woman living in a city who primarily shops online. So now for me, my breakdown might be a little bit different, right? Mine might be 
in my case, for my specific business, my target audience are 20 to 50 year old folks who live across the United States and nationally and are interested in starting businesses or have businesses and are trying to figure out how to grow or advance them. Now that's a very broad topic and I would break that down a little further by saying, okay, there's folks in startup mode, they need a certain type of information. There's folks in growth mode, they need a different type of information, right? And because you do that, you wanna then start to figure out how that content plays out. And then when I start to get into the content layers, again, thinking about those general topics, brand or business, and then the specific offerings. So for those of you who do follow me on social media, Edge Space Marketing, on Mondays, we do Marketing Monday, which is some type of tip, tool, or trick about how to use this digital marketing tool. It's something very tangible for you to use in your business. On Wednesdays, we do Wednesday Wisdom, which is some type of marketing quote and giving you some insight around why and how to use your digital marketing. And then we're working on this still, we haven't quite launched it, but we're gonna do a feature Friday, which is where we highlight and showcase some of the client work that we've done, which is a little trickier, but we're working through how to make that visually appealing and engaging for our audience, which is why we haven't fully launched that yet. So that's just to give you an idea of how we took this and broke it down and turned it into a topic um, strategy or content strategy. So we're gonna talk, talk content now, right? What is the content that interests your audience? So there's a rule in social media called the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the time you want to create value and you're only wanting to sell your products 20% of the time. Now you might say, but Nalini, I'm not selling anything on Instagram, but it has to do with your language, those specific call to actions. If every post that you're posting says something, something, and then it ends with contact us today for your free consultation, that's considered a sell. So if you're currently using social media and you're looking at your, your post and let's say you post four times a week and every single one of those posts ends with or starts with contact us today for your consultation or for this or for that, you're selling. And the problem is, is that folks are not on social media to be sold to. They're on social media for entertainment. They're there for motivation. They're there because they're voyeuring on folks' lives that they know, right? Think about how you use social media. You're not necessarily using social media for ads, right? So you have to find a way to engage with them and give them content that will speak to their values. And in this case, that's why we call it valuable content and um, what that means. So here are some suggestions for how you can create value. Solve their problems, right? In my case, Marketing Monday is a way when we provide tips, tools, or trends, right? Because I know that my clients come to me and they say, I need to plan my social media content. I don't know what scheduling tool to use. We did a post a couple of weeks ago on Hootsuite and why we like it. Um, we, could, we talked about yesterday, um, in SEO world, for those of you who are familiar with websites, what your title tag and metadata means. I'd say that all the time, but folks don't actually know what those words mean. So we did a little visual to show you what it means. You wanna provide some motivation and inspiration. Sometimes that's what folks are there for. Now it doesn't apply to every business and it doesn't have to be there, but that's some things that you can do. And then most importantly, use your frequently asked questions to drive that content. I'm currently working with a client that's created an online legal document platform and trying to figure out how to use social media to drive that content, right? So what, they, what we're thinking about is, okay, what are the frequently asked questions that folks are coming with, even though the explanations are on the website? And we're using each one of those FAQs to build a content post around. That's one idea of how we're using that FAQ to drive content. And then, of course, you want to provide tips and tricks and bust myths. Um, last year, I was working, for those of you in Stanford, I was working with the rock climbing gym Beta, Beta Rocks, and we talked a lot about what are some climbing myths about can I rock climb and injuries and can I do it alone and those kind of things because they know what are some of the barriers to entry, right? This is when we go back to that question about readiness to buy. What are the things holding people back from coming and checking out the space or giving it a try? without? They might not have known that they could get like a free intro trial or or uh, bring a friend and they can climb for free. Things like that when we talk about busting myths. Um, I do see a question in the chat I do wanna pick up right now, which is, does this apply to nonprofits profits and prospecting for donors to increase awareness about our organization? This is a very, very important question. Thank you, Robin, for um, asking it. For nonprofits, the answer is absolutely yes. 
Now, you might not be going on your social media with that quote unquote sell by saying donate, donate, donate. What you are going to talk about is what is your organization's values? What is it that you do? How are you making a difference? Why are you so important? Those are some of the questions you want to ask. I'm currently working with a nonprofit in Stanford and we're building a strategy specifically around that. Their donor base is hyper local and there are connections nationally. And so we're trying to figure out how to navigate that with the partner organizations and make sure that we showcase what they're doing, how the kids are being impacted in a positive manner and why they're so important to the community. And then lastly, show your business and brand in action. Now I'll say this, for those of you who do follow me on social media, I do a terrible job of this because I sit at a desk all day. My day is not very interesting, but I'm trying to open up a little bit more and showcase some of my life. Those um, who are in the um, food industry, they have a lot of good content showing behind the scenes of how food's being prepared or introducing the staff, you know, things like that. I have a team of four and none of them want to be on social media, so I have to respect that, right? So for me, I have to get a little creative about how is it that I can kind of show my business or brand in action. So what I'm going to do today is when I'm done teaching this wonderful class, I'm going to do a social media post thanking everyone for coming and just kind of, it's a way of showing that, hey, I'm teaching a class, but also in case you missed it, there's going to be a recording on YouTube, right? That's one example of how to show your business and brand in action, especially if you have a business that it's like in my case can be a little dry because I sit at a computer all day. So here are some best practices for your feed. When we talk about feed on Instagram, those of you familiar with Instagram, the feed is the content that goes up and down on the screen when you're scrolling. There's also part of your Instagram called your Insta stories, which scrolls across the top. I'm not gonna talk about that too much, but I just wanted you to know that this particular section is about the content going up and down in your profile on your feed. So you want to post your feed regularly, which is two to three times a week, and you want to plan it. You can post ad hoc, but if you plan it, then you'll have some strategy around what you're doing. You'll be able to break up certain things. So you're not talking about the same topic all the time, unless you want it to. You want to post to your Insta story with interactive stickers, right? So the Insta story, for those who are familiar with it, is across the top. It disappears every 24 hours or after 24 hours after it was posted. And they have something called interactive stickers, which allows you to do things like Q&A, some polls, some fill in the blank, those kind of things. And it's really interesting because when you're trying to build that audience profile, if you have a following and you're trying to figure out content, it's a great way to engage with your audience. You could even ask the audience, you know, I'm going to do a cooking demo next week. What do you want to see me cook and see what they're posting about? Now, you don't have to actually execute on all of them, but if you do put that out there, make sure that you do follow through because people do feel set up if you say, hey, I'm going to do a cooking demo and then you never do it. Now, if there's some reason why you didn't do it, maybe it might be worth posting like, hey guys, we had some technical difficulties, et cetera. And those are things you can post in your Insta story. Um, if you're a business that is, um, has a physical storefront, like you're a coffee shop or a restaurant or just regular retail location, if you have opening and closing hours that are fluctuating because of weather or other things, your Insta story is a place that you can post that as well and just say like, hey guys, today we have some adjustment to the hours, it's X, Y, and Z. It's just another way to connect with your audience. You wanna post your business team, as I mentioned, people wanna know who's working in the business, who are the people involved. It's not just some you know, ghost of a business that no one knows who's there. You wanna share tips and tricks. You want a response to comments in a positive manner. So this is going back to when you start to think about folks' values and how you might post things and they might feel a way about it, they're going to say something. People are very vocal on social media, especially being a faceless, nameless way to communicate. So you might get complaints. You might get negative things. Um, if it's outright harassment and bullying, you have every right to delete the comment. If it's just something general that may be opposing point of view, if you can manage it, find a way to respond positively and rather than delete it because there are people who pay attention, but it's up to you and your brand and how you wanna navigate that. You wanna tag and credit when reposting. It's highly encouraged to repost other folks' content in social media. It's part of the engagement model. It's actually very good because you're helping other brands as well. But the most important thing to do is make sure you tag them. So it's not just reposting their content, but giving credit where credit's due. 
You want to make sure you're using good quality photos and stock images. This is very, very important as a small business. Not all of us have the eye for photography, but there are some things to keep in mind. Is the photo grainy? Is it out of focus? Is it dark? Is it brightly lit? Is there something weird going on in the background? You want to scrutinize all of that before you post it because the reality is your audience is scrutinizing that and there's not a lot of forgiveness on social media anymore for not so good photography. So dark photos, not filtered. People expect that you know how to use all that stuff on your phone when some of us do. I, to be honest with you, I know how to do some of the basics with photography, but not very much. So a lot of our clients, we use stock photography to augment that because we don't always have that. We make sure we license them properly. So as a reminder, if you're using royalty-free stock images, um, and I'll show you the links for those in a few slides, that's totally okay. If you're using licensed stock photography, make sure you have a valid license before you use it. Because if you do post something that you don't have the rights to post, you may get in trouble for copyright infringement and may owe someone royalties. And then lastly, you want to make sure you engage with your audience. And I am going to talk about in a little bit in terms of what that means. But in a nutshell, it means don't just post to social media through a scheduling tool. And I did see a question about a scheduling tool um, pass through the chat. We're actually going to talk about that in a second. Um, you also want to make sure that you're engaging with your audience. And I'll also get into specifics for you as well in terms of how you do that. And then, of course, use trending topics. Now, trending topics could be as simple as like I made up one marketing Monday. You can use motivational Monday. I'll also show you what some of those topics are. And then you want to have a separate personal account. Once you start getting to the engagement on Instagram on your business account, your feed will no longer be curated to your interests. It's going to be anything and everything. And if you're doing this right, it should be anything and everything. Your personal account is where you're going to be able to curate how your feed looks and what you want, especially if you're an Instagram user, right? The other reason for this as well is that your Instagram, your personal Instagram can be the all about you show, right? your business feed may not need to be the all about you show. So for example, on my personal page, if I've got 50 photos, 49 of them are probably of me. And that's okay, it's my personal page. My business page is less about me and more about the business and more about the team. And especially in an environment where you have a team, be very careful and conscious about that because people are looking at the optics because if you're the business owner, you've got a team of 10 and you're only posting yourself, people may question your values just from that. And that could mean just because you're the, like in my case, my team doesn't wanna be posted. So it could optically look like that, right? So like, so here are some of the things that you want to post or don't want to post, right? Don't overpost, meaning that you want to actually, um, uh, you want to have a strategy and a cadence to it, right? So you don't want to be posting four times today. If you're going to post four times for the week, spread it out. Instagram also has this bad habit of once you start posting more than four times in a week, instead of showing your post in a regular kind of chronological order in the feed, they take all of your posts for the week and post them at one time or show them in someone's feed at one time. And that can get a little weird for someone who's following you when they might only need to see a little bit of your content, they're now seeing a lot of your content, which could lead to unfollows and you don't want that to happen. As I mentioned, you do not want to make it the all about me show unless, of course, you're a solopreneur and that is your value and your prop. Like if you're, um, I saw someone pass through here, Yvonne, who is um, a life coach. Yvonne will want to post about herself because it's her business solo and she's a life coach. So people want to see her. Um, you want to make sure that you're not posting topics that are irrelevant to your audience, right? So if you have a specific audience following that's about food and you suddenly want to start posting about handbags, you're going to confuse your audience unless, of course, somehow handbags is tied to your business. It's your second business. You're trying to help out a friend. Just be very careful how you navigate that because your audience are following you because you're a food page, right? Um, as I mentioned, you don't want to use dark uh, photos that are badly filtered or out of focus. Um, and you don't want to forget to use hashtags. Oftentimes folks post all the time and then they don't actually use the hashtags, which means you're not actually getting found or seen. Um, and I'll explain that better in a second. And then lastly, you don't want to miss a trending topic window. So for example, in my case, Marketing Monday, I can post that any other day of the week, but it's Marketing Monday. So if I post it on Wednesday, I've kind of thrown it off. Now that's very, very um, nuanced, but there are other things like whether it's St. Patrick's Day and I have a client that has green bagels. So if we don't post the green bagels specifically for St. Patrick's Day, we've totally missed the trending topic, 
Um, and I did see the question come through the chat in terms of why you need a personal account. Um, I didn't catch the name of the person, but um, just to reiterate that, the reason you want a personal account is for a couple of reasons. Number one is um, you don't want to make your business page all about me show unless it's absolutely necessary to run your business. So that's one of the reasons why so that your personal page might be where you're posting friends and families if you have kids and that's important to you and you want to post that you're posting that on your personal page. On your business page, you want to talk about like business strategy, tips, myths. And so it allows you to have a place to post the things that are important to you without overexposing yourself, one on your business side, and then also just kind of keeping it separate. It's a bit nuanced, as I mentioned earlier, and you'll start to see why as soon as you start to do all the engagement, your business page is no longer going to be a place that you want you enjoy being in. And I say that in air quotes, because some of us use social media because we want to, we actually like, I have a personal Instagram account that any chance I get, I'm in it. I'm always doing something and seeing things and laughing about things. So um, that's why. Now let's get into some tips and tricks for the person who asked about scheduling tools. And I think there was a couple of questions about scheduling tools. Um, here are some ones that are kind of commonly used. We've got Hootsuite, Buffer, Planoly. There's also Sprout Social. Um, there's a couple other ones that I can't think of at the moment. Tailwind comes to mind. I personally use Hootsuite for all of my clients. Um, Hootsuite's free plan gives you up to three accounts. So most of my clients are on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, and so it allows them to cross post. Um, you, if you wanted to pay for Hootsuite, you can get up to 10 accounts. And that's where you can put your Twitter in. If you wanted to put your personal account in there, you could. It allows, the paid account also allows analytics. So then you can get different reports that you need. Buffer and Planoly also have different versions of that. The thing that I don't like about Planoly is that Planoly is Instagram only. So if you only have Instagram, Planoly is really good because it allows you to do both your Insta story and your feed. Hootsuite now allows you to do your Insta story, which is new. Um, but I personally like Hootsuite because I can do all of the different accounts in one place, which makes it a lot easier. Again, use stock photography. So Pixabay, Unsplash, Pexel, those are three websites that are royalty free. So meaning you can download and use the images. If you're using Hootsuite, Hootsuite actually integrates with those three. And so you can pull them up right from the Hootsuite library, which is really nice. You don't have to do the double work of find it, download it, upload it. It's all right in there. Um, you want to create beautiful graphics using Canva and Ripple. So for those of you who are, uh, you know, kind of savvy with the computer, um, Canva is an online free graphic design tool. They also have a paid plan, which you don't necessarily need. The free plan gives you quite a bit of usage and you can, they have predefined templates that you can customize or even use them as is and just change your wording. Ripple is a really interesting tool because it allows you to create kind of mosaic style videos or montages. So sometimes when I have clients that we're working with their library of photos and the library of photos isn't necessarily the, um, the best and they know this, we use Ripple to kind of augment that. So instead of posting a static photo that we know is a little grainy, a little out of focus, maybe there's some stuff going on in the background, with Ripple, because the video, the photos are moving in and out and you've got video playing with music and some you know, really pretty graphics happening, it kind of takes away from the, the distraction of the photo not being perfect because now it's a video with other things happening. So Ripple is another good way. Ripple, again, also it's a freemium model. So there's a free plan and a paid plan. And then you want to research your holidays and trends. Now, you might say, Nalini, how do I know what are the weird things happening, like National Hot Dog Day and those kind of things? We we'll use a website called HolidayInsights.com. And from that website, you can see what's coming up in the upcoming month. We're also going to start in terms of strategy on um, Edge Space's Insta Story starting in April. We're going to be posting what they are and saving them to the highlight reels on Instagram so that you kind of got ahead of some of your planning to give you a place to check if you don't want to go to Holiday Insights. And so we're trying to create some resources for you through our Instagram. And then you want to try to figure out what your hashtags are. So these are websites come and go. I haven't used all hashtags in a while. I now pay for the hashtag generator through Ingrammar. Now, because I do this as a business, I pay for it. You don't necessarily have to. So then you can spend all your time searching manually if you want, or you can check out one of these websites that'll auto generate some of the hashtags for you. 
So here we're talking about what are some examples of content planning? So this is kind of a snippet from a calendar I pulled from a client that was a working document. So you'll see some questions in here. So this was specific for Stanford Innovation Week um, in 2019, as we were trying to figure out what is it that we want to post and how we post it. So we started with kind of looking at Mondays and Tuesdays, right? We have a full list of all the days. So when we looked at Mondays, we were thinking about, okay, we've got motivational Mondays. What are some quotes and photos we can post to get people going for the, for the week? And actually, apologies, guys. I see someone asked me to put the last slide back. So give me one second. Here you go, Robin. I'm assuming you're taking a picture. All right. All right, so coming right back to this, we've got Motivational Monday, where we're talking about um, followers and how they want to start their week. We started also thinking some people have the Monday blues, so maybe we want to commiserate with them or give them a pick me up. And then also Monday memories. Um, those of you who use social media are familiar with Throwback Thursday, which is basically some showing a photo from the past, which is very important these days with the pandemic because not, not a lot of us have stuff going on right now that are as interesting as before the pandemic. But Monday memories is another way to do that if you wanted to do something from the past that's really interesting and you want it to kind of be with a trending topic. When we looked at Tuesdays, Tuesdays had a lot more things. We had technology Tuesdays. So excuse me, since we're talking about innovation, we could have talked about our partners, our sponsors, some of the upcoming classes and webinars. Um, we had Trendy Tuesday, and this was a question here for the team was, is there a fashion track in SI week? So this is very important, right? We didn't know, and we know that the content was evolving. So this is kind of where we parked that question. And I think we ended up having a fashion track. So we came up with what's trending, like when you think of trendy, whether it was fashion or outfit or innovation, sustainability, those are some of the brainstorming we went through. Um, we've got Tip Tuesdays, which is answering those questions and those FAQs like we talked about. And then of course, Topic Tuesday, which is kind of similar, and it's sharing your thoughts on a popular topic or industry. Now, there isn't a specific formula to this. This is kind of what works for you and what works for your business. And the question in the chat actually is a very good question relating to this is I try to post every day. I also post in the stories, is that too much? Now that's a bit of an, a subjective question. In my opinion, if you're posting to your feed every day, that might be a little much. I would switch it to every other day in the feed because Instagram is grabbing all that content and not showing it to your users chronologically. It's actually showing all of that content at the end of the week to the users, which might be too much. To your Insta stories, you can do as much as you want in your Insta stories um, because that's gonna disappear. So I actually encourage you to post to your Insta story every single day if you can um, and to the feed at least every other day if you wanna hit that, that much of a frequency in your feed. Now, here are some co um, common themes. I'm going to leave this up um, if you want to grab a photo. As they've been mentioning in the chat, this will be up on YouTube, so then you can come to the slide. Um, but this is a great way to kind of start planning out your content. Here are some things that are really trending on Mondays for different reasons, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursday, Friday, right? So in my case, I kind of made up my own Monday. I went with Marketing Monday, right? I did put it on the list, but I made it up. Um, and then on Wednesday, we went with Wednesday Wisdom. Right. And in fact, this says Wisdom Wednesday as a trending hashtag. We reversed it. Um, and you can do that, and you don't have to do that, right? You can use these or you can make up your own, which is kind of the cool thing. So let's talk a few seconds about hashtags and why these are so important. And I'm staying on the slide for folks who want to grab their phone and take a photo of it or screenshot it um, so that they have this is that the hashtag operates like an index. So when you think about it on Google, you're Googling all kinds of stuff and you can find everything. On Instagram, you're not showing up on a certain topic if you're not using the hashtag for that topic. And this is why that research is so important. So in my case, the trending hashtag is Wisdom Wednesday. I decided to go with Wednesday Wisdom. Now, if someone was looking for Wisdom Wednesday, I won't show up under that. But personally, I'm okay with that given what we are trying to do. Right. So that's why knowing what hashtag to use is important. You can search for them yourself manually in Instagram and figure out where what's actually trending, what's showing so that you can know, does this hashtag actually make sense? So now we're going to talk about the engagement model. This is what I would call the most important piece of your social media. You've got all this great content and then you're going to say, Nalini, only two people liked it, me and my mom. Why is that? And so let's talk about that. That usually means that you're not being digitally social. So let's talk about how you stay engaged. 
you want to like, comment, and follow. Those are the key metrics. When someone says, are you engaging on social media? It's, are you liking a post? Are you commenting on things? Are you following people? Oftentimes, folks apply the Twitter model to Instagram, meaning use less hashtags and you don't want to be following too many people. That's kind of the Twitter model. That's not the case in Instagram. You want to be following a lot of people. And on my business page, I follow something like 4,000 people. My personal page, I probably only follow 2,000 people. And some of them I've been removing as I realize I don't really like them. On my business side, I leave them there. You want to repost Instagram content for brands of businesses that have something that's, you know, related to what you're talking about. So in my case, I could potentially repost from Hootsuite, from Canva, from Google, from Instagram themselves, because those are all brands related to what I do and also kind of adding to the credibility. What you're trying to do with all of this is you're trying to build a brand that people views as trustworthy, as credible as someone they want to work with right? So if I keep telling you that, hey, you social media, it's great, but my social media is no good. Would you actually want to work with me? Right? So keep, that's kind of the point of how you use this. Um, someone did ask earlier, I saw it scroll through the chat, is how do you repost on Instagram? You want to download an app. There's an app called Repost or Regram, depending if you have an iPhone or um, an Android. And that it's, it's kind of weird and there's a multi-step process to it. But the first step is you need an app that's like Repost for Instagram or Regram for Instagram. And then you'll follow the instructions on that screen in terms of how you repost something. You want to follow hashtags and account that so that you can discover quality content. Now, what this means is that in my case, I follow hashtags called digital marketing, web development, SEO. What Instagram is trying to do is Instagram is trying to figure out people who like what you like are also interested in this, right? It's a very weird nuanced thing to kind of comprehend. If that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. Um, but the point is, is that on Instagram, there's something called a discover feed and you're trying to end up in other people's discover feed. And you do that by doing some of this work by following the hashtags that are related to your industry. Follow the hashtags that are related to your target audience's values, right? Follow the hashtags that are related to your brands and other partners and things like that, or maybe it's specific to your geographic location. So in Stanford, we have a hashtag called Stanford Local. That's a good one to follow because I wanna show up for local Stanford stuff as well, um, things like that. Interact with your audience by asking questions. You can do this in your post or you can do this in your uh, Insta story. So for example, um, there's a local bagel company. And one of the things that we do is when we post, sometimes we just post uh, you know, a mix mash of um, different bagels and we'll ask what's your favorite bagel topping or what's your favorite bagel style. It's kind of an interesting way to engage and see what people post in the comments. And it also gives us stuff to see like whether people are engaging or not. Not every time people will engage, but it's just another way of when you're trying to figure out what that content is, questions are a great way to engage. And you want to respond to comments and DMs, unless it's spam. So those, you know what the spams are, right? Whether it's, oh, check out our website, Forex trading, those things. Um, if you get that in a DM, you have every right to delete that because it's spam. I like to report it first. The more you report the spam, the more likely Instagram is to take down the spam account. And it's also more likely that the spams are gonna leave you alone. So we do this on behalf of our clients where we go in and whether it's um, a spammer is DMing them or a spammer is posting comments, we report it and then delete it. And what we find is over time, the amount of spam that we get reduces because the spammers realize that particular account keeps reporting us because it's the same set of people running all of these accounts and they tend to leave you alone after a while. So here's something, and I encourage all of you, grab your phone, take a picture of this, write it down. These are the steps that you now want to do to build your engagement. You only need 20 minutes a day. I did see somebody ask a question about how much time you should spend on your social media. You can probably um, spend about, uh, I would say about one to two hours once you get into a cadence planning your content. When you're brand new at this and you're trying to figure out your audience profile and your content layers, it could take you quite a few more hours. You might spend a few weeks on it as you build it out. But once you've figured out what that is and you've kind of got a content profile built out and a content library you're kind of pulling from, you can probably spend one to two hours. I tend to tell my clients, do all your hard thinking once a month. So you want to do that um, at the end of the month for next month, at the beginning of the month for this month, in the middle of the month, whatever works for you. But if you start planning your contents two to three weeks ahead, you kind of get ahead of it. 
I'll give you a perfect example. We usually do all of our content planning for edge space marketing at the end of the month for the next month. But we kind of had some glitch and changing in staffing and some other things. Some people got sick and we kind of missed marketing Monday for the last couple of weeks. So I got last week's out on time last night. For those of you who followed me, marketing Monday went out at 930 because we couldn't miss Monday. It's marketing Monday. But we were scrambling to get content ready because we weren't ahead of the curve. And so things happen. And if the more you have planned ahead, the easier it is. So instead of spending the time yesterday doing my engagement model, we were spending the time planning content because we don't all have a luxury of a ton of time. And so that's why the plan ahead model is very important. Now, coming back to staying engaged, we've got following back everyone who follows you unless the profile is private, like 10 to 15 posts in your feed every day. That means in your home feed, go down, like, 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 just slow down, take your time. If you like too many things too fast, you'll start to get a little pop-up and Instagram says you're blocked for the next 24 hours from doing this because they think you're a robot. So you wanna do it a little, slow because I know you're trying to hurry up and get it over with. So I usually what I do is do five, wait a minute, do five, wait a minute. Um, you want to search for brands related to your hashtags, excuse me, brand related hashtags and like five to 10. This one gets a little tricky because there's a certain point where you've run out, but like today I might search for, you know, webinars. Tomorrow I might search for um, Instagram tips, things like that. And seeing if I, there's a hashtag that I could follow relating to that. Search for the cities and towns where you want to get clients on like, on like, um, like and follow the different pages if you're not following. Now, that's important, especially for hyper-local businesses, because you're trying to build that awareness and show up in the Discover feed for people local to your vicinity, right? And so what does that mean? So I'm based in Stanford, and if I want clients in Stanford, I'm going to look up Stanford and start liking and following them. And some of them may be like, who is this? And look at my profile and like it and might want to follow back. And that's the whole point of it is because I'm looking at that local model. In my case, my business is national, international. I kind of pick at different days of the week. I pick different locations. Today, I might pick LA and do it. And then tomorrow, I pick the United Kingdom and do it. It just depends because I can work with anybody anywhere. Um, very good question in the chat. Why do people leave lots of space between post copy and the hashtags? It's because they don't want everyone to see all of the hashtags, like they've this big list they've stuck at the bottom, because you want to use up to 30 hashtags as the maximum. And sometimes people don't like the optics of that showing. So what happens is, is if they post their caption and they put a lot of space, usually it shows up in quote, I think it's called read more in order to see the rest of the caption. So it's kind of a way to hide it so it doesn't look optically so bad, but there's no benefit to that or um, lack thereof. It's a personal choice. Um, so I've handled some of the questions. So Bob, I know you've been kind of grabbing them as we go. Are there any ones that I've missed? Uh, there's likely been a few that we've missed, um, but just before we uh, get to those, just a reminder to people, if you would like to submit a question, you can do it via the chat feature. And we'll take as many as we can until the uh, top of the hour here. So maybe um, I'll just go back, um, Nalini. And if uh, if you think we covered it or it was covered in the material later, then we can um, we can just jump uh, jump past it. So uh, the let me, let me just go back. Um, yeah, I'm scrolling back to. Um, and someone did ask if I can put the last slide back up. So I just did. Um, yeah, yeah. Is putting my web page address in a post considered selling? It's a licensed family sell your home. They don't actually sell anything except a service. Technically, the answer is yes. Um, so you don't want to put links in your post, right? Because in Instagram, they're not clickable. You want to put the link in your bio in that link section. Now you can say click the link in bio for more information. But if you're saying that every single day, that is considered a sell, especially in the service-based world. So much like you, I have the same challenge where I can't every day tell people, contact me for a free web consultation or you need a website, call me, right? So instead, in your case, you might put up stuff around the different services you offer, like that whole, what's the unique value proposition of your childcare. Maybe it's a specific activity that you're doing in the childcare facility that's unique, or maybe it was just a fun day. Those are some of the things you can post that net, might not necessarily involve a sell. It's about getting your audience to connect a subliminal message that, hey, I do this. So let me give you a different example using a chiropractor. One of my first clients was my chiropractor. And what we did was we did a 90% value and 10% ratio. So we didn't necessarily say contact us for a consultation, maybe more than once every two weeks. What we did was 
Every Monday we talked about mindfulness and something about your mental health, which leads to stress in your body. On Wednesdays, we talked about posture improvement tips. And on Fridays, we talked about, um, but I was, I think it was food fact Friday. So about the different vitamins and minerals and, you know, in the winter vitamin D deficiency, those kind of things. And in about, it takes about six months and about month five, people started coming and saying, we really like what you post on Instagram and we wanted to give you a try because they finally realized that, oh, hey, he's a chiropractor. Right. So without ever saying, hey, I'm a chiropractor. So in your case, you kind of want to toe that line with the child care industry. That's great. I'll, I'll go back to one of the earlier ones, uh, Nalini. Um, sure. it's, it's from Anissa. My husband is a general contractor and wants to use Instagram to grow his business locally. Can you provide any examples of how to create a strategy and to create in creating his target audience? Sure. So as a general contractor, he's probably looking at homeowners, condo owners, maybe property managers. So those are some of the initial kind of audience profiling that we're thinking of. We're also thinking about home ownership and those kind of things. So your audience is probably going to be 25 to let's max it out at 50, right? And then within that, I might start talking about, okay, what are some common things or issues people should look for? So a leaky faucet, maybe it's a tip around um, how to fix the leaky faucet. Maybe it's a quick little thing, like, you know, maybe you don't have the lever set right. I have no idea. Um, but that's just an idea. And this is the type of stuff I would sit with the client and talk through. Another thing that I might say is, okay, but that same leaky faucet, maybe he might want to talk about how, if you let it leak over time, there's a corrosive nature to it that leads to longer term damage. You don't want to fear monger, but give people the information they need to make a connection, right? So by doing that, if you look at, again, that subliminal message, someone might go, oh my God, my pipe is leaking. I should probably call this guy because he knows what he's talking about because I never thought about that right? Whether it's a running toilet and those kind of things. So I have no idea specifically what your husband's doing. Um, but those are some ideas around how you would start to craft that strategy. That's great. Um, here's one from uh, Joan, which I think you've covered part of it, but uh, mm -hmm. it says, how does one acquire followers and what is a reasonable amount of time to expect followers? And how does the algorithm rank posts? So the algorithm ranks posts based on um, how much people engage with it. And so this goes back to what's currently up on the screen, which is your engagement model. The more you do these steps, one through four right here, the more you'll start to see your followers increase. And it's an exponential growth. So if you think about an exponent, exponent you got two, four, six, eight, 16, you know, 64, like that's how it's growing. And so when you first start, it's going to be really small and then it's going to start increasing. Now, if you do this strategy for a month and then you stop, you're, you're kind of coming back down to zero. If you think about revving an engine and taking your foot off the accelerator, you're going to slow down. You've got momentum, but you'll still eventually slow down if you stop doing like applying some gas to it in this case. So, um, and the question that just came through the chat, how do you get people to engage? It's kind of by doing the same thing. The more you engage, the more people are likely to engage because Instagram is going to show your content to other people. Let me break that down a little bit more. Instagram is counting how often you open your app. It's counting how often you're doing all of these things. I like to equate it to a gaming system. We're playing a game where we don't actually know what the points are. We don't know if we're getting one point for a like or two points for something. We know we're getting points. We just don't know what it is. And so that's why we want to do a combination of these things so that Instagram can continue to say, oh, this person has more points. And so we want to show them to more people. A really, really bad and it's a really bad example, but it's the one that most people understand is that when you're in high school and you've got the popular kid that everybody loves, they're popular. And just because they're popular, everybody loves them. And you've got the kids in the corner that aren't as popular, that don't have as many friends. And if they suddenly became popular, they'd have a hundred friends, right? It's kind of what you're trying to do. You're trying to come out from the corner to become that popular kid on Instagram. It's a bad example, but it's one that a lot of people do understand. Uh, very helpful. Um, here's one from Lisa. When you're talking about the 80-20 rule, how would you incorporate your calls to action only on the sell posts or, or do you also incorporate them in, into the value posts? No, you would only put your call to actions on your sell post. The minute you put a call to action on a value post, it becomes a sell post. And so that's where it's tricky. So your call to action, unless it's very, very specific. So in the case of like going back to the bagel shop, when they have green bagels, the call to action is click the link in bio to order online or click the link in bio to order now. And in that particular case, because it's a restaurant, the call to action kind of makes sense. It's a restaurant. But if you're a service-based business, you've got to kind of toe that line and see how that works because not everyone will resonate with the constant call to action. 
Uh, we have one from Alicia. How can I build my email list slash drive community toward the website? Do I need to provide an offer for them to provide that information? Um, that's a little more tricky. And that's actually, I'm not exactly sure how that would tie into your Instagram because you're not necessarily building an email list from Instagram. If you are trying to build an email list um, for maybe your blogs or different things on your website, you probably definitely want to make sure you're using a mail program, whether it's MailChimp or Constant Contact, Zoho, those are some of the common ones. Um, and then just make sure that whatever you're providing is stuff people want because people already get too many email. We suffer from email fatigue. And so you just want to make sure, same like your Instagram, you're creating value. So if you can prove that, hey, what I'm providing is something you want, people will most likely sign up. Okay. Um, here's one when um, re relate to uh, scheduling and, and Buffer. Are there any negatives about posting via scheduling tool like Buffer? It, you know, it's kind of interesting. There was at one point, there was this kind of thought that your posts that are auto posted from a scheduling tool doesn't get as much visibility or priority. It's a myth. We don't really know for sure if that's true or not. Um, I've experimented with it for my account and for clients, whether I post it manually or post it through the scheduling tool. And I haven't seen a difference in the engagement. Um, so it, it's as far as I can tell, that's not proven that particular myth. As far as um, my personal preference is that it's it's one, it's, you can track everything you've posted. So as you're trying to figure out that I already post that, it's one in, all, in one place. And second of all, it just makes life easier. Like I said yesterday, I was scrambling to get Marketing Monday out because we didn't plan ahead. And instead of doing our engagement, we were doing that yesterday. Uh, here's one from Yvonne. When posting to multiple accounts simultaneously, what's the best flow, Facebook to Instagram or Instagram to Facebook? So the way you have to do it is Instagram to Facebook. You can't actually post Facebook to Instagram. The connection doesn't work in that direction. So it actually have to be Instagram to Facebook. But if you use your scheduling tool, going back to Buffer, Hootsuite, um, you can do all of them simultaneously. So you don't have to do that manual push. Okay, great. Um, here's one from uh, Mia. As a jewelry artist that sells um, handmade jewelry, how do I post trending topics I also have a separate music account. How can I shift to engaging the audience? People usually don't reply when I read and respond to their comments. Do you have a suggestion to keep track of comments to respond quicker? So the first, and Bob, I might need you to reread re the last part, but the first yes. part was it's a jewelry line. So um, going back to those trending hashtags, you can post in your Insta story, you could probably post you making a piece, whether you do a time-lapse video, you could even do that in the feed. Your feed is definitely going to be a little bit more, um, not necessarily on the sell side, you know, you got to be careful with that, but you're going to be posting your products because that's what people want to see. So whether it's showing some behind the scenes of how it's made, some, you know, you can do behind the scenes of even the photography of them, like in the light box and those kind of things. Um, and in your case, a trending hashtag would be trendy Tuesday, jewelry's trendy. Um, so there's definitely fashion and we, we could look at the list and see if there's other ones that you can come up with. And you don't have to use that list for trending topics. It's just a good place to start. Um, what was the question about music, uh, Bob? Yeah, it, it just says, um, I also have a separate music account. How can I shift to engaging the audience? So that one's interesting. So here's what I, what I would recommend is because you own both, right? And this is what I do is when I post on my business page, on my personal page where I have like, you know, thousands, a thousand followers, you know, 300 of which I personally know, I actually take my business post and I post it to my personal Insta story. So it's kind of like reminding people like, hey, I own this business, go check it out, right? Or even just saying like, hey guys, support my business, right? That's your personal stuff. So in your case, you, you can try to cross post in the Insta story and see how it does, but that goes back to the issue of not confusing your audience, right? If they don't know that you're involved in both of those businesses, it can be a little confusing. So you might just have to run them as separate strategies and just, you have to do, in your case, this 20 minutes a day becomes 40 minutes a day because you're going to do 20 minutes in each account. Okay. Um, uh, here's a question from uh, uh, Calvinia. What is the difference between using the hashtag and the at sign in tagging? So the hashtag is a topic, right? So digital marketing. The at sign is an account. So the at sign would be at edge space MKTG or at um, score, I think it's called Fairfield County score, right? It's whatever the name that's called your handle. The at is your handle or someone's handle. And that's when you're tagging a person, a page or a business. The hashtag is a topic. So that's digital marketing. That's something you can make up. You can't, you can't do an at to something that doesn't exist. I mean, you can, but it won't link, but you want to actually at an actual person. Okay. Uh, we have one from uh, Kathy. 
Is Canva what I would use to type over my photos? That's the one big thing I don't know how to do. Yes, actually Canva is a great place to do that. You would upload your photo. And in your case, if you're using Instagram or if it's an, you wanna do an Instagram post or an Insta story and Canva has great tutorials to walk you through it. Um, and you can pick the style that you want. So if you wanna do an Insta story, it gives you the right dimensions. If you wanna do an Instagram post, it also gives you the right dimensions, which is the perfect square. You upload your image and then there's different types of text styles you can put over your photo. Okay. And we've got maybe time for one more um, from Julianne. Um, is putting my web page address in a post considered selling? Yes. And actually, I think I answered that one, Bob. So I'm going to grab the last one that I saw in the chat was, do sure. hashtags still work if your account is private? The answer is yes. It will work for your private audience. So you may not show up in the public searches for things, but for folks who are private, you know, you will show up. So you won't show up in folks' discover feed. So you still want to do it if your account's private, if you want to be part of the conversation, but it won't grow your audience at all because you won't be seen or discovered. So that's actually very important. You wouldn't believe how many business pages I see that are private when they should be public because you can't grow an audience if no one can find you or find your content. So thank you for that. I will add that to the presentation. So yeah, please make yeah. sure that your business page is public, your personal right. page uh, and good private. Point. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for uh, questions. Just as a reminder, the webinar has been recorded and the materials will be available within about 48 hours on our website, fairfieldcounty.score.org. And you just, um, when you go to that website, you just click on on-demand webinars and it will take you to our, um, our, our content there. Uh, our next live webinar will be a week from today, Tuesday, March 23rd. And the topic is the top 25 ways to get your prospects to believe you and close more sales with Ed Winslow presenting. And again, if you would like uh, free individual counseling, you can use the bit.ly link that you see on the screen, or you can go to our website and click on the request a mentor button. And if I could also ask uh, people to please fill out your evaluations that are being sent after the webinar, they really help us out. And in closing today, a big thank you to Nalini for uh, presenting today and uh, stay well, everyone, and have a great day.